what I will try to do today is to run through this recording um, and make it a bit short so it doesn't take three years to, for you to actually listen to it but I will just produce a short talk so that you can make sense out of this PowerPoint on Learn line. Okay, so we actually are talking about innovation. A couple of quotes I wanted to uh, re uh, produce from our earlier PowerPoint just to, for you to keep in mind what is important when you think of language. Right, we play to win. We try to make selections that are most suitable for a particular context and for uh, us as um, participants in the communicative act uh, to achieve maximum impact. In other words, to say what we actually intended to say. Now, this is another one that I stress in my classes on campus, which is, uh, and I've raised it in my um, YouTube recordings. Uh, it's just because someone produced an ex uh, expected response that didn't guarantee any form of understanding that we're after. So we need to think a little bit uh, critically about what, what understanding is and how can we test for it. Comprehension checklists that are very popular in education and I would suggest are the last way to go. So that was our content. We were looking at indicators of progress today. I will just run you through a couple of, a couple of slides about uh, what goes wrong when people do particular things, and then we move on into innovation. So um, the field of TESOL is um, filled with references to second language acquisition theory uh, or theories. There's a number of them. There's about two or so that are dominant, which is the socio-cultural um, model or approach to doing research in second language acquisition. And you have to know this is not about how to teach, this is how to measure, right? People actually don't make this distinction very often and they take stuff that was never meant for education um, then into classroom and strange things happen. So cognitive and sociocultural approaches. Um, cognitive is typically known as uh, Michael Long. There will be other people, obviously, but we have here Michael Long and these people here who have set the trend. And the point that I'm making here in this slide, and I do not want to give more time to this uh, approach, is that, and I mentioned it in class on campus, but I don't think that many people remember. So when a student says something and you want the students to know that you didn't understand or that there was a problem, you can say, ah, but I tell you one thing, that is actually scaring a student. The student knows they did something wrong, but this is not a help. Um, same. The same happens here when a child says or student says, I am a friend, there is no guarantee that there is correction. You have many friends, right? Is actually the right way to support students when they say, I am a friend. I am a friend. I am any friend is a reflection of particular of, of, of a particular way in which a when it, in which a student organizes uh, relationships in English, and I would argue they need to be broken down quite a lot uh, in order to actually truly support a student rather than just provide what I see more as uh, penalizing a, ch a student rather than assisting a student rather than. And, and doing so by simply correcting the student, right? So you can see that I am not a fan of these things. These are not actually meant for people to use them in education. These people have a particular framework of looking at, at language. They don't see language how language educators see language. They see language as grammar 
and they play with it. They, I refer to them as experimental linguists, and most of them see themselves as such. There are famous people, you don't have to know, I'll just say here because I'm talking about it. I can't remember anymore his name, but Greg is the surname. And he um, always made that point that they don't actually do this stuff for teachers to take and implement in classrooms. But teachers are desperate and they take anything that has a language learning word next to it. That's why we need some critical thinking here so that we don't always reproduce this type of teaching. Another one is sociocultural approach. I will actually leave it for you to read. I'll, I'll give you an example here from Kramsch and basically what happened with Kramsch. Kramsch, Kramsch is a professor at UCLA or Berkeley, I can't remember anymore. A famous person. Um, she speaks, speaks a number of languages in a native way. Um, she's quite uh, well known, well, not quite, she's very well known. But what she does here, she sets up the parameters of a situation for students, makes de decisions for them, uh, what they should do, how long that thing should be, more or less how it should look like and how they're going to go about it. And then when she asks them questions, and I'm not sure whether I posted them here, okay, she asks students about the reasons why they made particular changes or uh, why they worded things the way they did. Kids, did, not kids, they were not kids, they were migrants who came to, us, uh, to America because it was, this experiment was run in an American uh, migrants program. Well, you'd be, you'd be, um, you would find it quite hard to guess how were they in that situation to make guesses or make um, critical selections of words they were to use? Because we have no situation. We didn't have any situation. All we had in her activity was a classroom setting with her telling them, now there's a story read the story, write a summary, make sure it's only four lines or whatever. You see what I'm saying? A summary is not a summary. You can have a situation where you sit with a friend of yours in a coffee shop and you ask them to summarize a movie and you say, how was it? And she, will, and she would say, not worth talking about. That's it. Here's your summary. They didn't need four lines. Uh, you can have a summary in court where it's quite detailed and it's structured in such a way to avoid as much as possible ambiguity and not to set up the person whom you want to represent or uh, whose interests you want to uh, support in the wrong way, right? So people have to think before they open their mouth or as they are opening their mouths, they actually do a lot of thinking. Now, there was no reason here to do some thinking. She told them straight away. So once the teacher takes over the entire activity, doesn't enable, and there's no larger context around it, what happens, students just basically play the teacher's game. They give the response, but there's this response by the, they give a response, which was all right. They produced the summary, all went well, right? If you were to run a very typical Australian literacy program, you would have ticked it off. You would say, great, they did it, they summarized. But Crumsh, who is a professor, and even she, though she might have set it up this without much of thought, she's a professor and she said, well, I better find out what processes they had. And they say, no idea. And then they say to her, well, you asked us to summarize, so we did. Didn't think much about it because there was nothing to think about, right? That's um, very important for us, and I, was, and I will actually come back to, this, uh, to these, question, to these uh, statements shortly, because this is the difference. If there is a difference, there are two differences be between modern, um, our students from overseas want to call them communicative language models, we can call them communicative. I have no problem with it. So between communicative language models and the past, the difference is 
that students don't just talk they have to have a situation they have to be put in a larger context where they have to find themselves they have to understand their position they have to understand the stakes in the game and now and then they have to be enabled to explore the options they have in order to act on an informed basis interesting isn't it uh, so you can read it here for yourselves right Kramsch had a problem here she was saying but students were just playing a ped pedagogy game which they were wrong whereas I in my PhD when I analyzed that activity I said well in fact was the other way around students played what they were uh, requested to play um, so at and Kramsch actually didn't, in that particular article, the reference of it you can find in the, uh, in the references in my PhD, I think I have given you the reference. In that article, she didn't produce uh, any criteria for assessing her own, for evaluating her own teaching. So we had no parameters really specified as uh, marking progress or indicators of progress for and indicating a communicative what communicative language teaching is there was a discourse I mean she's smart she knows how to write there was a discourse about it but we didn't have any parameters against which we could actually uh, evaluate uh, the model and she doesn't evaluate she goes straight into accusing uh, students of doing the wrong thing and um, but for our purposes what's important here that we can see but she didn't think critically and the students answer said well you asked to summarize with it so there was nothing to think about there was nothing to think about obviously okay well now we can move on to innovation in class i was trying to explore with students um where we will look for innovation because i know that when you um, the assignment is about innovation and creativity but what would be innovative and obviously um there are myths in education and, and more, I don't know whether more of them in TESOL, but quite a lot of them in TESOL. So when people see the word innovation and creativity, they now think of um, what kind of activity I could invent for, for it to be different. So I ask in class um, what would actually be, what would actually be an indicator of innovation in um, TESOL. And it took us a long time I will not tell you 45 minutes I can't remember a long time to actually get some things right here because it's not easy people usually get bogged down in detail whereas the principles are the ones that we have to look at if communicative language teaching was about changing the paradigm from seeing language as neutral which was in the past the thing you just write on students brain or make them memorize so we stopped seeing language as neutral, but we started to see uh, language as a um, product of cultural learning. That is not only, but that, that it that is not what happens is it's it's always in play, always every interaction, the one you do with your husband, the, the, the one you do in school, every interaction adds to that language, and that's how language continuously evolves. Because today we don't speak the way we used to, a hundred years ago, three hundred years ago, six hundred years ago, and probably a thousand years ago English didn't exist. It's a very new language. So now we have actually brought in the idea that it is a um, cultural artifact, and that it is used um, by people according to the history or in relation to the history of the experiences that they had in that particular language. So we learned as a result that not everybody speaks English the same way. <coughs> not only that, and um, just to remind us the points we made earlier in the year, in, in the semester, which is that students are non-native English speakers or non our English learners obviously then they will look 
or they will be selecting things out of English according to their histories right so it's not only that two English speakers select according to their own personal histories but see, and that creates problems in schools because we have children who are from privileged uh, backgrounds where the experiences are either broader or are the ones that school um, endorses and then we have children who have more narrow experiences and therefore their language is not um, up to scratch and therefore in education in Australia we create pathways for disadvantaged children so that they can actually broaden their experiences and therefore broaden the language that comes with it. So what we're having now is the situation that we started to recognize that students and people are not just clean uh, slates on which we write but in fact that they come with particular networks pretty well organized and well uh, vindicated by the experiences that they were correct that they worked so in Cambodia speaking Cambodian in the context they spoke was good worked well now people come to Australia and as migrants or as students and they want to learn English and they read stuff through their experiences so where will innovation come in as I argue the innovation comes in in teachers capacity now to actually um, take on the challenge that children are his the pro products of history or students are product of products of history and now we don't give them English we don't teach them the rules what we have to do is to think is to think strategically and creatively of how to engage their histories in order so that the demands of English that they encounter they can relate to them without their first language being an obstacle but on the contrary being crutches being support and you wonder well how can their Cambodian language which is completely different has different ways of sounding and just writing different and so on how can it be a support well it is because it has to be because that's all that the student has all the world of that person is in Cambodian everything he knows or she knows is Cambodian or Cambodian in relation to his or her history we can't just kill it we can't wipe it out we can't deny it in order to be inclusive we have to embrace it engage it and see how we can make it work for the student so now our objective in innovation is to engage students histories not to pretend they don't exist and that's what has been done for uh, in other methods of teaching we were people pretended that those um, histories did not exist and they were very hard trying to replace students history with some imaginary history they thought um, was correct and we know that that didn't lead to much because a number of problems were, were happening and one of them obviously that authentic language doesn't use use neutral language and dialogues and just plain descriptors to put it differently language is not about producing text because as the experience with Kramsch shows to us you ask us to summarize so we summarized right so Kramsch was not happy so what you see language is about using is about selecting from a range of options or maybe I should put it critically and, st and strategically selecting from the range of options right so that to achieve maximum impact or as I put it after Calhoun who is a professor from New York professor in history and sociology to play to win right to win you don't want to be ambiguous or taken wrongly okay so human beings or people or students are historical creature language itself doesn't exist but it's only existing in communication it's always undergoing a process of evolution because those 
individual or local interactions uh, uh, gradually change it. So now our role is to break away from the past and be innovative. Innovation starts with conceptualization. We have to change our thinking and then innovation just follows. If we don't change our thinking, we have no idea what we're doing. So basically what I will be showing to you, and I've shown in other examples for in the undergraduate students in those videos that I created for undergraduate students, but what I show is how to now engage students' histories and make them work for them so that they can actually approach English as supported rather than learning and memorizing everything that we have sold to them as new. Right? Some things are new, but some things are not. So you can now browse through the other slides I have created and read it for yourself. Now here. Um, so when you actually write your uh, PowerPoints and later on your assignments, um, the final assignments, I want you to start your PowerPoint with very clear descriptions of what you actually are presenting. Um, I find the unit that the designs of units of work with, that are on the internet are most mysterious pieces of lack of creativity I've ever seen. So the ones I saw. So what I would like you to to, to state are the things that I argued for in other videos and, it, and you say this unit is how long? How many times a week will you meet students? For how many hours? And what is it that you engage students in? So for example the thing that I'll show you here is you are just it's, it's just a, a, a unit of work I invented in uh, the class on campus just to make the point about how to engage creatively and uh, critically students' histories. So I invented this thing. So the first thing we need to know is what will students do? What, what is it that we're engaging them in? Because then our teaching is to support it. Right? We don't teach anything. What we do, we support students in actually completing their projects. Now, if you recall my undergraduate lectures, what I said, this is no different than when you go into a sand pit with your child and you say to them, well, what do you say? Well, this is a, this is sand, this is grains of sand, this is 90% water, this is a bit of something else, it has minerals, minerals come from stars when they explode, and then it takes billions of years. You don't do that. You say, okay, let's do a castle. That's what I want. This is the approach. This is the castle approach, sand pit approach, right? Sand pit approach. Let's actually be very clear what students are actually doing so that they know how to relate to your activities in class and that you know the focus of your activities. And these are statements here about higher order uh, skills um, of that I would be so you, you can mention them and then you can actually later on explicate them at the end of uh, PowerPoint. Once you actually in, uh, take us through the design, you can now, you can then um, summarize the design by saying, you see, I told you, this supports communication because this support, it's the unit also design, the unit's design, the unit, des the design of the unit supports also ICT skills because, and you say why, it su supports information management, and then you say why, right? So you, you first say to us what you will be doing, and then once you actually take us through the design, then you write a summary and you tell us how you actually were supporting these skills. Now, uh, uh, st students that um, are from, are to support, to actually work with uh, Australian curricula, um, you would have known how to now work with it because you would, I expect that you would have seen the uh, YouTube recordings are produced for undergraduate students. You have to see them because I can't explain twice, three times the same things. Now, okay, so this is another thing. But if language is a cultural artifact, 
And we don't just talk, but we talk in order to win. We talk always in order to, right? So we have two elements of innovation. The first one is to engage students' historical, uh, his pardon me, to engage students' individual histories. But the other one is we can't just make them create um, a thing. Let's do a recipe, which is what people do in schools very often. But the recipe for a banquet will be presented and maybe done differently. And is it for, to actually train people? So is that the recipe now going to be in a recipe book, which is a textbook? Or is it going to be in a book to teach mothers how to cook for children? Is it something that sells? I mean, you, every activity has an audience. We do in order to affect others. Right? You don't have an audience, you don't have communication. You don't have communication, you end up exactly where Crunch ended up. Just saying to people, just summarize, just go and summarize. Right? Just go and summarize. And then I write an article how you are actually playing a pedagogic game. You know, you didn't know why you were making selections. Well, how could they when they had no audience? The only audience they had was to stand in front of the blackboard and explain to people how they summarize. Not explain, but, but just reproduce the summary. They wrote it first on those little pieces of paper, and then they, in front of the class, had to actually say it. So where was the audience there? They were all doing it for teacher, to the teacher. If I were to do it for students, then I would want to know, for example, um, how should I be positioning them? Are they the, what, what will they be judging? Right? What do they want to? My um, rhetoric? Can I talk well? So I need to have a clear statement about my relationship to the audience so that I will then be in a position to actually make critical de decisions about how to actually work with them. Okay, so what I did uh, for the purpose of this um, unit that I am designing with you, I have actually created uh, a unit around students being involved in creating an interactive map. So what happens is that the city council wants an interactive map and they ask many people, they ask us, it's, well, you don't have to tell them, they ask other people as well, they want uh, students from our class and it could be, you know, um, six-year-olds, it could be eight-year-olds, it could be 12-year-olds, it could be 16-year-olds, it could be 50-year-olds, anybody. Right? It, the, the activity itself is not depending on the age. What will the age will determine how it's done? Okay, and maybe also the level of students' English as well. Um, but I just don't like being too deterministic. Okay, because obviously, 50-year-old, a 50-year-old will have a better idea how to make it fun. So a lot of things will be more sophisticated than. Uh, as if and the interactive map was done by a smaller small child okay so this so what i okay so we've said um we've said what how long is the unit we've said this is what they're gonna do the interactive map the city council wants an interactive map and our students are gonna produce on the net uh or or a thing that can be displayed through the internet uh, an interactive map now, in the other video, I have shown you this, this particular graph, and it's very important. Now, what I want you to think when you design your activity, I want you to always keep in mind that the job of education is to expand students' frames of, frames of reference, how they think, how they see things, how they evaluate things. Right, so um, I have produced this thing here. I can argue that that theoretically but you know what it will do uh, for, for this unit and it's pretty good and if you can think of better ways I'm very happy for you to replace my framework but I want you to have a framework pretty much stated in your PowerPoint so, and I'll show you how I worked with this framework as we go through this PowerPoint I'll show you how I worked with it so we want to expand students perspectives regarding what people do why they do things and how they do this. And you know yourselves now, but all these elements are cultural 
uh, artifacts, right? There's no reason why people do particular things and those things no others. There's only that these reasons and these activities are culturally embedded. They are product of culture. They evolved as needed or as relevant. You can, this, I put it just for you here because um, it's good to know. This is not, this shouldn't be part, this particular slide shouldn't be part of your assignment. I just, um, now what I want you to do is if you, if you, if you want to, and I'm really, and I would be really, really happy if you did that, copy and paste. That's why this PowerPoint is actually online, so that you can actually take this particular graph and paste it into your par PowerPoint if you follow my framework. If you follow some other framework, I will be then uh, looking for the logic of it and how you actually made it apparent to me. But the criteria will be again the same. I'll be looking for innovation, meaning that activities have an audience and that students are engaged as critical, uh, that you engage students' histories. Because the idea that I get from pre service teachers, oh, we will just engage students. And I go, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, they will move. Well, that's nice. But has that theoretically actually um, powerful? Right, so I, so that. So we will be expanding there what, why, and how, and the structure of each lesson should follow this particular, should also have each lesson. So if you meet students for five weeks and each lesson is, ten, is two hours, each of those meetings should have this element, this element, and this element. You might be talking about them differently, but I will be looking for something that shows me how you actually supported students in expanding their frames references, frames of reference. How did you do it in a way, this is the autonomy now, how did you do it in a way that um, was engaging students' histories, which means this element of individuality has to be here. Um, obviously, all individuals are social, product of social cultures, but none of them is the same. So therefore, I call it autonomy, so that I don't actually uh, produce wide sweeping statements like all Afghani children will be the same. They all will think the same way. You know, they are all the same, right? You know, only the red, rednecks people like that talk like that, right? So that's why I call it autonomy and achievement. It's very important that all your meetings, which is if it is a two hour uh, lot, five times, um, five times, but two hours each uh, for each time. It's important that each of your classes ends on a high note. And what I mean by that is that you structure activities that at the end of uh, each uh, meeting, students created something. Students felt, oh, we learned that, we did that, we're good, right? So it's not like, and this is, I'm not talking about testing because that's a hang up from schools. I'm saying students produced something they felt they achieved. Remember, nothing succeeds like success. Oscar Wilde, I hear, was the one who actually said that, right? Nothing succeeds like success. You make them feel good. They were doing exploration, so you were raising their awareness. You did it in the way that engaged their histories, which meant you have accounted for autonomy. And then you also then enable them to work with all of that and do something creative, wonderful, and they can feel that they are learning. So the next thing I want to say in your uh, PowerPoint is um, lesson one. How are you going to actually get your students on your side? This is um, how I talk about it, right? You come to the class, they don't want to work with staff, which is boring, right? And you would get a resistance if you come up. So how do you actually so-called seduce students or engage them or put them on your side where they want to do something? So they're, depending on the age of students, um, as I said, it's quite, it's quite interesting to actually say, to show to students, it would be very interesting to actually show with students, to students the request from the city council. Then, in the, then also remember now, what you want to do is to account for the what of expansion, that people do different things, right? People do different things. And children from different backgrounds are aware of particular activities that people do, but from other backgrounds, they are not. So for example, for, uh, maybe a Sudanese girl that was raised in a desert may not know that, girl, that there are maps. They might be actually going around their territory differently. 
that's why I actually put in the Aboriginal uh, painting because Aboriginal paintings are very often the maps of a territory. There's a whole story here. So, um, so people do different things and they use these particular ways of doing those things. So in Western culture, people sort of draw things very two-dimensional thing. In an Aboriginal culture, people create these paintings where they have, you know, I don't know, let me let me just make up, okay? There was a gathering, there is a circle here. So there was a gathering. And then the person had to go out, leave a circle, and go on a journey. And as they went on a journey, there could be some sort of scratch, scratching, I don't know what's here on, in detail on this painting. But you can see these symbols here on the ground. I don't know what they are. But you see there was a meeting, this is a big meeting, there's this big circle, but there is a small circle here, so there was a smaller meeting at this place. I don't know what these grains here symbolize, maybe just the bush, just the place where it was. And you've got even a smaller meeting here, so there was a meeting of kind here because it's a little fire. This is a big fireplace, this is a, a medium fireplace, and this one here is quite small. Um, so. I am not saying that I'm reading this painting well, but I have been trained a little bit by a very famous Aboriginal painter, by a very famous Aboriginal painter, how to read the paintings of Aboriginal, Aboriginal paintings. Um, and um, I'm just sort of showing to you that they are written from above and they actually reflect the ground. And they are a territory, they are a map of a territory. Okay, so p you could actually as people, as you, as, as the city council requests from your students to actually create an interactive map for tourists who come to your town and they want to know what's there, right? You can now change it. You could ask for an interactive map. The school, the school um, principal wants an interactive map of how to get from different suburbs to the school by what bus, how the bus goes which is, you know, telling directions and stuff like that. But, you know, it's not like telling their direction, directions in a really sort of simple way of the past. This is now a wonderful task, big task. We're doing this and we're doing this for other children or for people who come to our town. So these are different examples just, just to uh, show to students that children actually or other people, depending on the age of your uh, students, use maps. Right? Here's another one. So that it is very important. We bypass very often in schools these elements because very often we forget to uh, marry education and TESOL because TESOL had its own life. It actually was not as uh, integrated in the field of education. It evolved from linguistics. Um, so these ideas about, about expansions are not that actually popular or ingrained it in the field. So you look at this children playing with map in the, not playing, actually searching through the map, maybe to help mommy in the car. So all of that, you, you actually now students are warming up to it. Oh, other kids play with maps. Oh, la, 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 la. you can even play the game. There's this funny game so that uh, children can actually, so, you know, get themselves more warmed up to the idea this is a geography, uh, this is a map of Australian states, so that children can actually start getting sort of a picture of um, how the map works, or at least the Western map, how it works. I wouldn't have a problem actually now that students would be doing a map which will have on it Aboriginal um, overtones, and maybe we could also, because I have not enough knowledge about it, but if other cultures do maps differently, then you could actually put other ways of telling where we are on the map that students create, say, in an Afghani way or Sudanese way or um, Polish way or whatever. I just don't have enough um, knowledge about each of those cultures, but we make room for students. So there it is, lesson one, introducing the project objectives. Is, would be in terms of what, why, and how. Here is the what. First, people do different things. We will look now to the objectives of lesson one in terms of why and how. So in terms of why, we go here, show different purposes for which maps are used. So you can show what I just showed you just about. They were just basically that peop different people use maps. And now you can actually show different uh, movie clips you might find on YouTube 
with parents describing directions um, to the school, to the child, by policemen describing directions, by a geography teacher, I don't know, you invent, I'm just making it up, okay? So that's the second objective of lesson one. And the how, show how maps are constructed. Now this is, becomes really fun because this is the imagination going. There are iPhone maps, there are GPSs, there's Atlas, handmade drawings, interactive maps online. I haven't actually explored them well. And then you have Google Maps, maps which are also interactive. Well, that's interesting. Now students are getting really sort of like, where? Wow. Wow. Right? So we, we sh we're showing to them. And you can also how, how show how maps are constructed. So this one, this is the Australian map, or sort of Western map. You can show an Aboriginal uh, painting and how they construct the map. Right? So, and you, you, you would have to, because your students don't speak English uh, either at all or well, uh, you will have to think of strategies of, uh, of actually how to make the story apparent to them. So as we go through this PowerPoint, you will get more and more ideas. So at the end of the day, you will actually get ideas also here, how to do this. Okay. How to, so Aboriginal paintings as maps, and I don't know what else, maybe South American, or I don't know, some Indians or whoever, or what, I don't know. So that is up to you, depending on the class you have. Now you do some reading here. Why are we doing all of that? Why do we why do we so, do so much? Why don't we just tell them to do it, right? Why do we go through all of these pictures and this what, why, and how? And it was really brilliant from our student. Uh, I think he's from India, and he he was the first one to remember that people are historical beings, and he was the first one to remember that what we need to do. Is to if if we are to assist students with strategies of how to uh, engage, how to hmm, I don't want to I don't want to say create meaning because this is just uh, such a bad phrase, but how to act meaningfully and make meaningful connections. What we need to do is to remember that they read things by selecting what was relevant to their culture, their first culture, so-called first language, but let's call it first culture. Their first culture is interfering hugely. So if you say to them the map, they just might be reading it like, oh no, that's what daddy does, I don't. Or that's what boys do, we don't. Oh no, that's gonna be so boring, right? So it's up to you now to expand students perspectives on this activity so that you actually get them excited and as a result they change their initial feelings about that activity and as a result it will appear you have actually generated some movement in their frames of reference dare I say expansion Right, so that's what we want. We want to reduce ambiguity. Very often, feelings like I don't want to do it come not from children's lack of interest, but misunderstanding of what's involved. Okay, let's go next to the next slide. What would be the achievement for lesson one? Now, let me say that when you do these explore and compare, and you p students are looking now at different interactive uh, maps and what's on them and so on. That's going to take you two hours. You'll be lucky to finish that in two hours, actually. Uh, so up to you how you're going to play it. But um, um, what would be the achievement now? Well, the achievement could be that students might take some of the pictures you made them, enable them to find about who people, what people actually create maps and and they create the first slide for their map or the, the cover for their map. And it could be to select a map of sorts, doesn't matter what map, might be the map of their town. And then they put all these pictures that, you, that, you ha that they have identified with you by clicking on things. I mean, I, I like do, using the smart board and iPad. And I know that some of you might not have them yet in schools, but we're learn learning to actually teach for another 30 years. And I would be really, really hard pressed to, if someone made, 
wanted me to say that in 10 years time schools will still not have smart boards or in 20 years time so i think that schools are increasingly well equipped there's 5.4 billion dollars was uh, awarded to education to actually fill the schools with uh, stuff and then if you don't have them once you actually got this methodology and understood it and you know how to actually work with it with technology then you can sort of play back uh, push back a little bit and say well how am i going to do all these creative things without actually having such a fast access to computers where well, you can actually create resources and you go where you download things first and then students just play with what you made available and you actually as you run it you just use it your resources a local uh a, a local uh what product uh displayed on the smart board you don't even need access so what, even if you use video clips you can download them from youtube okay so kids can actually create nice sort of stuff here and then they have a first page of their map and they go yep we know where we're going now right okay so now we will go to lesson two lesson two objective is deciding on the tools and things students will on the, basically on the kinds of things that students, I don't know, the tools with which they will probably show stuff and the things that they want to show. Okay, so basically the, on the things, let's, let's, let's make it very simple, deciding on the things that students will show. Okay, and students will now actually start making those selections. What is it that we will show on our interactive map for our for the tourists that come to our town. Okay, so let's have a look at support. In terms of what? We could actually investigate, you could actually create a database of pictures. So, and you actually, you sh you, uh, it would be quite smart if you actually, before you, this is my sort of product, right? But before you actually go as far as this, you create, um, let me think about it let's call it a table i'm not sure whether it will be a table let's call it a database whatever it is so here you will have landscape and you write these words they will learn them i mean the more the people see certain things the more they actually um, acquire them the faster they acquire so you can say and here you could have um pictures of landscape so students click here and they will see something. Students click here, they will see something. They will click here, they will see something, right? So the landscape of, I have put there, I created a map of Canberra. Well, I stole some pictures, which when uh, I've collected over the years and had nothing to do with Canberra, but nobody will know. <laughs> Most of our students are from overseas, so I can pretend all of those pictures there are from Canberra. So, okay, so the first, so we now actually give to, it's about support, right? So we just, we're not gonna, uh, oh, did you see what happened? <laughs> okay, so you select everything together with this, and then you can move it. All right, so landscape, what else could be? A museum, right? What else would you be putting there? Um, parks? Because parks are not quite like landscape, right? What else could you put there? Schools? Because they're children, so that's relevant. Uh, but students might uh, um, explore with you whether tourists actually like go to schools to visit them. So maybe schools are not as relevant. Maybe our school somewhere, we will put our school somewhere on the map, but not maybe many schools. Well, I don't know. Um, flora. You can also have fauna for all I care right and you basically so people will have these diff you create you create this is how hard it is for teachers to actually work in the communicative method you actually do a lot of work you prepare the resources so when your students click on it something comes up with a and that something might be whoops a picture of the canberra of the lake in canberra right that's the lake in canberra and you might actually have a sound file available to, with it. I am not saying to do all of this, all this uh, tedious work for the assignment, but what I would like you to do is to do what I'm doing now, which is to tell me the story about the support 
that you will create and how you're gonna frame it will you be doing what I do what why and how and autonomy awareness achievement or will you be doing something else and I will be looking for my ingredients in any case because I want to see how expensive you are how you think of expansion and how you actually design your lessons so that children actually know that they are learning okay so if you click on insert in um, in a PowerPoint you can insert audio so this particular thing can have a voice file um, attached to it and we you know what also pays off when you actually when you say it's a uh, uh, lake in Canberra or Burley Griffith Lake you might say whatever however you will call it it's actually it does pay off to have different voices recorded that's also an additional support uh, because what will happen is uh, children I mean people from different countries select as I thought in, on campus but maybe not necessarily um, online people say from Poland and from France and from Vietnam will be selecting higher pitch sounds whereas English is this low but because it is very very foreign to me to talk like this I can't do it so <laughs> I will not be doing this but it's very interesting so but when you actually have sounds of different people saying the same thing you increase the uh, chance of your students to actually hear more in those words than just one single sound you could even have a little game next to it so this is um, different sounds will be so click here there will be different sounds and if they click here what will happen is there could be a little pronunciation exercise here so you one of the things in Eng so two things in English you can teach which is this sort of low pitch burly griffin you know like burly griffin like lake not lake lake uh, so that's one thing and another thing in English is that English has or makes its first consonants very long and this is a very good way to help students to slow down their speech and as a result be actually more clear because when they speak like this the first time they get to get speak step and now but they not with them right so they speak fast especially people from india or poland or italy they have their native languages are very staccato the same maybe with indigenous students i don't know and indigenous students just like the polish students will not be actually making these first consonants very long and therefore they disappear as we pronounce them so you could have a little activity here so kids go like oh yeah oh yeah oh okay okay and then the next one so there's no big pressure on doing big pronunciation class until everybody sweats it's just the next thing and the next thing they will open the next thing will open and you will have the same sort of game next to it so they can actually hear the name of it pronounced and maybe even written um, if they if they click on pronunciation they'll get just it pronounced if they click on writing they'll get it written that written down and then another thing is actually how to how to pronounce it's a little pronunciation exercise attached to it oh well, that's cool you see how much work to do is involved in order to actually break down what seems like a simple activity and other people make it simple which is oh just go on Google get some pictures put them on the map and here it is we've got already our objects let's get on with it and I'm saying well please let's not finish the interactive map but at least let's have an interactive learning because at the end of the day whatever task or project students are engaged in it's only an excuse for learning so it's so I don't want you as teachers to get into the beat of it 
and then start sort of thinking, oh, we have to get on with it. We have to get on with it. We've got to finish it. And then you finish in three weeks and you go, oh, what am I going to do? I've got another two weeks. Right? Doesn't have to be finished, can be done just even even if half of the task is done but well that's fine we just put half of the task online and another class next time will complete it another group so our students did a bit and someone some other group can actually complete it right think about it always um creatively um because it's the learning that counts so if two groups actually complete this resource isn't it even better because we have more people involved, more people from the same school got involved in creating an interactive map for the city council. All right. Not to mention that people are actually learn learning what the city council is. At the same time, you might actually show them and uh, show pictures how they actually what role they play. OK, so we've chosen all these things. We even have um, have exercised, created some exercises for students to know how to pronounce, how to write it and so on. So students will decide what stuff to put in on the map, right? So they've done, they put up some stuff on the map that they want to create. I have left this original map underneath and I just made it as put it at the back. So you um, right click it and you send it back, right? It just looks better. Look at this. If I remove it, see? It doesn't look nice. So when it is up there, it just provides this lovely background. And actually you can, students can think, oh, this is a uh, school and we will show you how to get to Lake Barely Griffin from our school. We will just create a little activity for tourists, how to come to our school. All right, or some other object, okay? So we've put up stuff here. Now, I have these question marks. Well, because now we really want our students to put some names underneath it here. So because what we want it interactive. So what we want is a tourist to click on it and find out what it is. We want the tourist to click on it and find out what it is. Now, notice what I would like you to actually support students now and they can already do it. Can they put names? These these are mountains, and they call can call it I don't know Brindabella Mountains in Canberra. This is University of Canberra. This is the uh, Arboretum in Canberra, which is the uh, I don't know what to call it a, a place which they built to save trees. And there's this beautiful restaurant there and everything. This is Burley Griffin Lake with a Commonwealth Bridge or, or whatever bridge, any of those. This is the, um, the thing where they play this, these instruments. I forgot at this very moment what it's called. There's, this is the wild part of the, build, of the lake side. And this is in the wild part. There is this uh, bird hide where you can actually watch birds. And that's why I have this bird nest here. You wouldn't know until you actually make it bigger. Um, okay. So challenge you. Can your students actually now be able to name the things? Of course they can because we've just done it before we actually even put those pictures on the map. And before we decided that we will name them, we actually have done all this work. So you see, we've supported them already. So now... This task to name these things is not daunting. We know how to do that. We can even say these things. We can even record ourselves saying these things. And we will do it the way we ha our teacher did it. We'll have a boy and a girl recording the voice sound separately. How's that for ingenuity? See how simple it is? So the idea is not to actually do these things that people in schools do very often or oh, we do brainstorming or they have nothing in their brain you have to actually find ways of how to dig it out at nine o'clock in the morning they are asleep or they are really excited that they saw their friends plus they don't have tools they don't have a language to talk we need to actually put this stuff in their heads and that's one way to actually do that okay so they they've named the things they've recorded